Welcome to the Hey Boomer podcast, where we are committed to delivering quality programming to people over 50. The mission is to inspire and collaborate with each other to continue to contribute, grow, learn, and dream, and live the best life possible as we age. My name is Wendy Green, and I am your host for Hey Boomer. Hello, Hey Boomer listeners. So good to have everybody here today. And today you are going to meet Renato Vicario and Jeanette Wesley. And these two people are so dedicated to growing and harvesting fine herbs, rare fruits and spices, and then capturing their essence in their artisanal liqueurs and fine spirits. Their distillery is located in Greer, South Carolina, which is a treat for me because that's not very far from where I live. And so going out to their distillery and their farm, I encourage all of you, but we'll talk more about that. And as you'll learn when I introduce Renato, he was born in Italy and Jan spent quite a bit of time in Italy. And I had the opportunity to visit Italy, Tuscany, actually, about 15 years ago. Um, A a group of of couples, we all rented a uh, villa in Tuscany. And one of the people from the couples with us was from Italy. So she had arranged to have a cook provide us with our welcoming meal. And that is when I learned that a meal in Italy, or at least in Northern Italy, is an experience. It's not like we go to the restaurant here and you get everything served all at once or you have it at home all at once. It is an experience of many courses and wines and liqueurs to go with every course. It takes a couple or several hours to get through a meal. And it's about the camaraderie and the fine taste and the display. And that was something else that I learned when I went to Italy. Um, We went to what, I, I guess it's a market, you know, but it was indoors and everything was displayed like a work of art. Even the gelato stands. I had to take pictures of the gelato stands because it was so incredibly beautiful. So you will not be surprised when you hear Jan and Renato talk about the distillery and the process of making their liqueurs and how they put so much passion and love into this and how you use these liqueurs to enhance your eating experience. So this is gonna be a really special show. The Hey Boomer community, all of y'all, we are so dedicated to giving back in whatever ways that we can. And one of the things that I am doing this year is I am putting together a walk team for the Walk to End Alzheimer's. The Walk to End Alzheimer's is something that I have participated in for the last, I don't know, seven, eight years. Uh, My mother, even longer than that. And it's, it's an easy walk. Um, We do it from Fleur Field, the baseball field here in Greenville, and it's October the 2nd. So there's a couple of ways that you can support us. You can go to our particular team page and sign up to join us. You can go to our team page and donate to the Walk to End Alzheimer's. Or if you live somewhere outside of the area, you can have your own walk team And it could even be a Hey Boomer team because guess what? We're going to have Hey Boomer hats. So if you guys start a team somewhere outside of Greenville, let me know 
and I will be sure to get you Hey Boomer hats. But please go ahead and sign up to be on the team or to donate and help us reach our goal and help us find an end to this horrible disease. Uh, on a better note, if you have friends, well, you all have friends. If you have friends who you think would be interested in this show, please go ahead and tag them in the comments. You can tag them by putting an ampersand in front of their name and then their name. That will let them know on Facebook and LinkedIn that you are um, recommending that they watch this. If they can't watch live, they can always watch the recording or they can catch the show on most of the major podcast channels, Spotify, Stitcher, Apple Podcasts. So go ahead and let them know about this show because this isn't one you're going to want to miss. And I see lots of people. Hi, Gail. Hi, Ann, Judy, Doris. Nice to see you all out there. And without further ado, I want to bring on Jan and Renato. Hello. Hi. <laughs> so glad you guys agreed to be on the show. Our pleasure. <laughs> Let me tell people a little bit about you. And this is a very um, shortened bio because your lives are so interesting and varied. And I'm going to let you tell some of the story too. But we'll start with Jan. Jan was born here in Greenville, South Carolina, under what she refers to as a grand tent of an extended family business that involved her parents, grandfather, aunts, uncles and cousins. Mm -hmm, that's right. And, and so having a family business now with Renato and your children has just was natural to you. Completely. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so Jan and her dad shared a love of gardening, which is still one of her passions today. And as a single mom of three young children, Jan enrolled in an interior design course at Converse College. But with the encouragement of her professors and with the winning piece of art in her college exhibit as a freshman, she switched her major to fine arts and graduated with a Bachelor of Fine Arts degree. During the time that she was in school, she spent a summer in Cortona, Cortona, Italy, okay, <laughs> with their children. And they all felt at home there, you know? So that was a big leap to take your kids to Italy for a summer while they were in school and school age anyway. But she did not meet Renato in Italy. <laughs> so let's talk about Renato. He was born in Milan, but spent much of his childhood along the shore of Lake Maggiore. Yes, okay. <laughs> on the south side of the Alps in Northern Italy. He was taught to raise his own food and find food in the forest. And Renato raised snails and rabbits. And Between everything else. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, but, but what he did a lot of was spend hours in the kitchen with his grandmother and his great grandfather, great grandmother. Um, and by the age of six, he was helping them make liqueurs following family and Italian tradition. Can, sure. you, imagine, yeah. can you imagine teaching our six-year-olds to make liquor? <laughs> <laughs> no more in Italy. <laughs> by the age of 13, Renato went to boarding school in Paris. He studied at the Sorbonne in Paris and Cambridge in England and he graduated from the Catholic University in Milan in economics. He spent many years in the travel industry and had his own travel wholesale company with offices in Italy, Thailand, Costa Rica, and Hong Kong. And then one day in Ristorante Bergamo. Perfect. <laughs> in Greenville, South Carolina, Renato and Jan happened to meet in the kitchen. Interesting. So how did that happen and how has this love story grown? <laughs> well, uh, at the time I was concentrating more on my office in Costa Rica in San Jose. 
So I was back and forth uh, uh, between the two countries and I didn't want to eat alone at home. So obviously you go to a restaurant, but at the same time, I didn't want to eat alone at the table. So since I was very good friend with Nello, I just ordered it and then went and parked myself in the kitchen. <laughs> so they served my food in the kitchen and I could talk to the chef. And for me instead, <laughs> I had spent two consecutive summers in Italy. And when I came back home, my friends kept telling me, I wish you would shut up about it. <laughs> <laughs> but it was just something that got in my blood and I fell in love with it. I fell in love with the food, the culture, uh, the people. And so naturally I navigated to the Italian restaurants in Greenville when I got back. Um, Ristorante Bergamo was a, a favorite and I got to know the chef as well. So my friends and I, when we would eat there, would usually stop in the kitchen and tell the chef, thank you. It was a really lovely dinner. And one night I saw this guy in the kitchen sitting on the counter. And so later on, I asked the chef, I said, who, who is that guy? And I, what kind of person is he? And is he married? And, da, da, da. and so he says, oh, you know what? I'll just set up a dinner party for you too. <laughs> Um, and, you know, what you can meet and talk and you can see if <laughs> any sort of magic happens. <laughs> and so we did. Um, we went to this dinner party at the chef's house and uh, uh, we played roulette. Oh, right. fun. <laughs> <laughs> no, fun. Um, for pennies, not money. Not, <laughs> and so um, we... Um, we had a nice conversation yeah. and all this. And so um, I thought, well, maybe he'll call me. Well, long time went by. Oh, it Renato. Finally <laughs> called me. <laughs> I didn't ask her for, for her phone number. And then he went out of the country for a couple of weeks or something yeah. like that. So we met that way. So, And was, one thing led to another. Yeah, yeah. So how long did it take before you all married? Oh, a long, oh, a long time. time. Yeah, a long time. Yeah. We we decided to live together to give it a try. For 10 years. For, <laughs> for, for 10 long. years. Yeah. And yeah. then we said, well, if we survive 10 <laughs> years together, we are okay. Yeah. Now, some of those 10 years were in Italy? Well, we purchased a, a house in 1999 in Cortona because we both loved Italy and we kept going to visit. And I said, well, why don't we just buy a place? Because we're spending all this money on hotels and well, all this. Well, time we have the kids as well. Right. We're right. traveling with us. Yeah. And so, um, so along came the turn of the millennium. And I'm kind of famous for my New Year's Eve resolutions so um, and sticking to them. And so we made a decision or I made a decision. OK, <laughs> by the turn of the millennium, we were going to own a place in Italy. And so we just got busy and, and kind of found yeah. this place and made it happen in about six months. Yeah. So and we, we were going to have a big party <laughs> for all of our friends right? Which we on did. December 31. And it was ah. a great party. We had friends from all around the world. Uh, we Came we from, did a from dinner. From Peru, from Switzerland. Yeah, from, yeah, from everywhere. Say. And so we did an around the world dinner celebrating New Year's Eve every hour that it turned. Oh, how fun. What a great idea. Food from Thailand, food from, from Japan, Japan. All the way to the United States. <laughs> it was fun. <laughs> What a great idea. Yeah. So so the property that you bought, is that where you started your vineyard? Yes, Correct. but not for a while. When we when we bought the house, it was way bigger than we ever dreamed that we were going to buy. And it came with this olive tree orchard of about 250 trees <laughs> or so. And I looked at the former owner and I said, we don't know anything about olive trees. <laughs> um, and so she said, oh, don't worry. There's this guy next door. He'll come over and take care of them for you. You know, it's, it's pretty easy. And so we met this guy who is still working with us today and has just been our, our right arm over there. 
Yeah. Um, and um, so we bought the house and it came with the olive trees. Um, it didn't have any vineyards, um, but that came later. So we, we purchased some land later and planted vineyards and went on this wine mission. So, <laughs> well, giant mission. yeah. And I, you know, I'd like to just briefly talk about the slow food movement because mm -hmm. It, it plays into the way you take care of land and the way you sure. have like the cherry trees and all. So would you talk about that a little bit? Sure. Um, so we, um, we've we been members of Slow Food for eons. I can't even remember when we first joined, but um, it just seemed like a really uh, an organization that we just fed with because all of the principles that they adhered to was were things that we really were in tune with. So protecting the environment, protecting foods that are endangered, um, protecting uh, small farmers and um, all of that sort of thing was just right, uh, right up our alley. So eventually we got involved in our local chapter. We became board members. And then uh, later on, I became the chapter leader of that group. And we spent many years, I don't remember how many, maybe 10 or so, uh, as leadership of that group. And Renato did some amazing cooking classes for yeah, just really- Yeah, was taking care of all of their events for cooking, yeah. for uh, learning, for kids at school. Yeah, and... we did all kinds of stuff. I mean, the, we could talk about that on a whole nother program probably. Yeah, I, I just bring yeah. that up because I know one of the things that you did in your vineyard, and I want to talk about the mm -hmm. vineyard and then mm -hmm. what brought you here, but one of the things you did was to preserve or grow those rare cherries. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so what happened um, along the way, we when we purchased this additional land and planted vineyards, um, we were all the time making wine, but we were also having fun making our own liqueurs at home. Um, and Renato would go out, pick up grass. I would call it grass. I mean, all this stuff out of the lawn. And he would come in and he says, oh, I'm going to make this Amaro del Campo. I said, well, what does that mean? Well, stuff I picked up in the yard. <laughs> so, and that one was really great, but we can't remember what he put in it. So I guess it's never well, going to be made again. We, uh, we would have to go back to Italy <laughs> or three years yeah. in between June and July yeah. and see what grows but, because that was the important thing. So the cherries, we, we had these trees there. There were these um, really amazing sour cherry trees. My kids used to love to climb up and eat them. And we would always warn them, well, you got to go out right when they get right because if not, the birds are going to come in and eat them all. Well, one day they waited one day too late and all the cherries were gone. So they were all upset. But um, anyway, the, we found out this cherry um, back to Slow Food is listed on what Slow Food calls the Ark of Taste. And the Ark of Taste is this catalog that they put together of rare and disappearing foods. Um, and of course, on that, there are plant species, there are animal, um, animal breeds, there's um, different cheeses, there's all kinds of salami, all kinds of different things. And this cherry is on that list. And so we thought, oh, wow, we have, we have something pretty special here. We started doing a little bit of research on it. We couldn't find really any place that sold them. So we started cutting the, um, they, they shoot up these little sprouts at the bottom. And so we would take these sprouts and replant them. And we had, um, special area in this land that was not good for vineyard because it was kind of at this river bottom. So we started planting the cherries there. And um, so eventually we ended up with about 300 cherries. It's perfect um, for the cherries. It's a rare and endangered cherry species called the Vichole di Cantiano. And it's just perfect for liqueur making. So we just love it. And that is what is in your savage cherry That's right. cure. And I <laughs> love that. I did buy some of that. That was so good. So Renato, um, then you left Italy and you came to Greenville or Greer and decided mm -hmm. you wanted to start this distillery here. 
So would you tell me a little bit about that? Well, that's a long story, actually, because uh, I didn't come here to start a, a distillery. That was a passion, okay? My regular business was, uh, I've been, since 1968, uh, I've been uh, a wholesale travel uh, company. Wholesale travel companies are not open to the public. They're not travel agent. We are the ones behind most of the very big groups, universities, and so on and so forth. So I came here to establish uh, my business in the United States because the majority of my clients were from the United States. And um, I grew it really to having an office in, in Rome, in Bangkok, in Hong Kong, and in Costa Rica. And only afterwards, after I met Jan actually, that uh, she really pushed me to start writing a book mm -hmm. of liqueurs uh, because uh, that's, that's right, that's it. Because <laughs> every time that we used to go and walk, I used to test her basically with all <laughs> this old history. And she says, you know, you know so much about it, you need to write a book. And that's... Yeah, so that's really how the distillery <clears throat> idea came about. We were, like I said, in Italy, but also in the United States, um, at home, just making these liqueurs, just like you would make, you know, if you're going to make lasagna one day, we might be making Nocino one day or something. <laughs> so um, we were making all these liqueurs, and every time we had these dinner parties and friends would come over, you know, it was just like, okay, we can't wait till the end of the dinner and, you know, and have some of these liqueurs. And so it was kind of the, always the big hit at our dinner parties. Where and, can we find them? <laughs> and then after the book came out, um, we were going around with our publisher everywhere and everybody wanted to know where they could buy these liqueurs. And we said, well, the whole idea of the book is you make them at home yourself. Right. You have all those recipes in here. <laughs> But that's, you know, so we decided there must be a market for this. Um, people really want this. And we kind of set about uh, just, we looked for a building, which took a long time. Um, but we finally found this place out here in Greer. It's out in the country. It's got seven acres in the back. And that's when we started, uh, started the liqueurs and started the farm here um, and started um, really more so in the wholesale end of it, um, trying to work work out the business end of it. Um, that was in 2014. Yeah. Well, it's a treat to visit the farm because, you know, you're growing all of these herbs and spices, and vegetables and things that go in these liqueurs that, and all organically grown, right? Mm -hmm. And then to have Renato walk you through you know, this is how the whole process works and then to go through the tasting. So it just, can you briefly go through what the process is from, from growing the herbs to the harvest, to the mashing of it all and okay. mash. You start with the growing okay. the herbs. <laughs> so, you know, the choice of, we make 16 different products here. So we make gin, and, so, we make, so be 18. <laughs> and we make um, <laughs> mostly liqueurs. So we had to narrow that down by what we could make quite well, what, what would be possible to promote on uh, a, you know, a national market. So the choice, the choice was kind of a big deal. Then once we got the choice down, we had to decide what we can grow in South Carolina what we can grow in Italy, yeah. how are we going to manage all of that? Um, but because we really wanted to have hands on in the growing of the herbs, fruits as much as possible, because the more you can control that, the more you can control the taste in the final product. So for example, here in South Carolina, we grow French tarragon, lemon verbena, uh, lavender that goes in our gin. We grow cardoons, wall germander, all kinds of sort of strange herbs. And say, for example, as the day we're going to make our dragon cello, we go out and we harvest the French tarragon, which means 
cutting um, with scissors little pieces of the, the tips of the herbs, collecting it in a small basket and racing it inside, washing it, uh, putting it in a salad spinner and then putting it into the spirit. And that happens in about 15 minutes. Wow. And the reason that has to happen in 15 minutes is because the herb is so Taste. fragile. So you, you really want, that's what I mean about control of the herbs is you, you know, it's not just how you grow it, which is very important not to put any pesticides because all of that stuff will be extracted into the alcohol once you put it in there. Mm -hmm. um, so you do want a very high quality product that you're going to start with. So we get that into the spirit and then it goes through a maceration. You can tell about the process. Yeah. Then the maceration basically is like making a tea. The only difference I say between you making a tea and my making a tea is the size of the tea bag. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Our tea bag is big, you know, and uh, the maceration follows actually the period of time that I set up each one of the liqueur as a recipe, which I wrote particularly for that liqueur. So it has specific terms of maceration, specific term of maturation afterwards. So basically you have uh, a macerate uh, stays in for uh, 30 days to six months, nine months, sometimes depending on the consistency of what you put in to macerate. Uh, then uh, uh, you filter it. And so macerate means what? M macerate means immersing basically is the same thing that you do with a tea bag. You are immersing the tea in a liquid something that let's call it an extractor rather than a liquid because it could be anything it could be water wine alcohol you know so you're going to put it in an extractor to extract the flavor that you want to have that's why you you cannot have pesticides you cannot have mm. anything inside there once that maceration is finished so between 30 days six months or whatever it is you take it out of the water and uh, we do an additional process, which is a second maceration in plain water. This is water, which is a reverse osmosis process. So very clean water and it extracts completely everything that is remaining inside the vegetable material. After that, we put it in a fruit press, squash it out. Uh, at that time we have uh, the old element, the vegetable, they could be recycled in the ground without any problem. Compost. They, they can be composted, which we do. Uh, the second thing is we have uh, a uh, water-based uh, tincture. The tincture is the first one with the alcohol. The second one is whatever remained in the vegetable. We mix it with a sugar because by law, a liqueur has to have X amount of sugar. Hmm. It is specified by law. So that's the difference between a spirit and a liqueur, is the liqueur has to have uh, a sweetener. It doesn't matter if you use honey or sugar or whatever. And it has to be flavored with something like uh, herbs, nuts, fruits. No, yeah. Hmm. So okay. basically we import uh, from Colombia uh, one of the best sugars that we found actually, uh, which is actually evaporated cane juice. So they take the cane, squash it, and the cane juice goes in the sun and the sh sugar is what remains. After that, it gets all mixed, filtered, and then left for a little time because time is the essence and then bottle. And so you bottle it in these dark bottles, mm -hmm. right? Why, why is that? Uh, dark because, uh, yeah, okay. you can show it that way. Hold it closer. Uh, every time that you have, especially vegetable compounds, uh, you want to have it protected from the sunlight. Uh, if you want, if you put a piece of PVC out in the sun, after five years, that PVC is disappeared. Uh, mm -hmm. It's melted away because of the power mm -hmm. of the sun. The same thing happens with the vegetable compounds. So you prevent oxidizing, that's mm -hmm. oxidization. 
The second thing is uh, we uh, keep telling uh, people that once either they drain the bottle completely or otherwise they have to uh, make sure that they take the air out because that oxidizes as well. Take the air out. Yeah. Oh, Just so like what they do with the wine bottles mm -hmm. many times. Okay. All right. I didn't know that. Yeah, right. so we have a we have a special tool that we call the Archimedes Spirit Saver, which is basically you just drop glass marbles down into the bottle and it rises, the, the liquid will then rise up to the top of the cork. So you're just doing it by displacement. That's why we hmm. call it Archimedes principle. Yeah. <laughs> hmm. And so uh yeah, so it it's a easy old fashioned way to to keep your spirits. Well. So it's not as much cold. A cool, a cool environment is perfect, but sunlight and oxygen are your two main. Okay, so so all of you listening can hear the passion that Jan and Renato have with this. Um, and we need to plan a trip, all of you hay boomers, we need to plan a trip to go out and see them in Greer because you also do a tasting Correct. experience there. I know most of your business is wholesale, but um, can you walk us through the tasting just briefly, what that's like? Sure. We, um, we invite you into our tasting room. Um, Which is have, lovely. Thank you. Um, so it's just a, a renovated home that we turned into our tasting room. Um, I wanted it to be quite intimate um, so you don't have, you know, it's not loud. Um, we try to play some nice music. Hopefully you like it. <laughs> And um, anyway, we take you out and show you our farm and explain how the herbs are used. Uh, you can taste them. So we'll pick off a little piece and you can try what they taste like as a fresh herb. And then we take you into the processing area after that, show you the whole process, how we do things. And then um, you come into the tasting room and sit down and relax and you get to try all 16 of the, the things that we make. So little tiny, little taste. tiny taste. I know. Cause I, I was there and I didn't get overwhelmed by That's it. Great. <laughs> <laughs> but I, you know, the artwork that goes into this too. So as I mentioned, Jan has her bachelor in fine arts and, and the brochure, I mean, it's absolutely gorgeous. Mm -hmm. It also describes each one of the um, liqueurs that you're going to taste. So um, as you're going through, you know, you can make notes about what you mm -hmm. tasted and, and there's notes in here about how to best use it. And one of the things that I learned about, but I want to share with everybody is some are used for aperitif. Some are used for digestive mm -hmm. and some are bitters. So can you explain how they're used and what the difference well, is? The digestives and the bitters are in one category. Okay. Uh, the main one would be before dinner and aperitivo. after dinner, which is the aper aperitivo means uh, comes from the Latin aperire, which means to open. So you're opening up your stomach. And basically, it's uh, the herbs are uh, compounded in a way, so the selection of the herbs is made not to be overwhelming, but just to stimulate, especially your palate. Uh, it induces you to produce more saliva. Saliva contains tealine. Tealine is one of the enzymes, the first enzymes in digestion. At the same time, it sends signals to the liver to start preparing more bile because uh, you need uh, to process the lipids afterwards at the exit of the stomach. Then everything goes in the stomach, and at this point, you need to have the digestive. So it's a help, it's a kick, basically, uh, especially if you have eaten a little bit more than normal. <laughs> Which you <laughs> always do with an Which, Italian meal. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it's, uh, it basically kicks it back. Uh, to operate in normally, which means uh, to digest properly. Mm. And this is where the bitter herbs come in, especially. Uh, bitter, we, uh, uh, we tend to think about it as poison, as bad for you. Bitter is actually good for you. Uh, bitter is, uh, is an element that allows you to tonify 
usually your body and uh, all most bitters are tonics because of that so mm -hmm. they're really very good they're just think of that name you know so I have to make an addition here. Uh, we are, as an American uh, spirits producer, never allowed to tell you that these things are good for you, that they aid you in digestion. Right. Um, because there is alcohol, of course. Um, so um, these, these do relate. All of this um, is traditional. So all of the, you know, the word aperitivo, the word digestivo, these are traditions in Italy. So that's how they were made. That's how they began being made. Um, as choosing these different types of herbs that will stimulate various components. Um, so uh, again, we can't can't tell me it's good for me. Well, but no. <laughs> at, at the time, they didn't have the chemical industry that yeah. we have today. And therefore, most of the medicines, they had to rely on what was available by nature. Even today, if you look at most of the medicines today, they come from nature. Mm. They come from studies of nature. Mm. And, and then mixed with alcohol. Well, <laughs> I have to continually remember that. <laughs> True. But at the same time, they are mixed with alcohol at the beginning for mm. extracting. Yeah. Alcohol, to me, is... Uh, it's an extractor. It's only a means of extracting the maximum possible from a herb. It just happens to be alcohol. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, and you had said, Jan, I think you had said that if you don't use the whole bottle, you have to, can you really use a whole bottle just for a meal? I mean, say it's just uh, you and Renato. <laughs> no, on I doubt door, it. Yeah. <laughs> Right, and in a liqueur, no. No, we do have um, we do have an option of a 50 milliliter bottle. Um, that you could probably use for yeah. the little ones. Yeah, yeah. but so. uh, that's why she was talking about the Archimedes principle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, you know, technically speaking, this, uh, this was the way that we used to do it in the old days because we didn't have any money, but everybody <laughs> played with glass marbles, you know. Mm -hmm. And therefore, you took the marbles, cleaned them well, mm -hmm. boiled them usually, and you put them in a bottle because even wine at the time was precious, mm -hmm. you know, after Second World War. So you put the glass marbles in a bottle to elevate the level, the content to the neck and to stop the oxidization. So that's a very good way of doing it. Yeah. Well, I loved, I loved the book. Um, you know, when I saw it first, I have to say, I was like, oh my gosh, this is going to be heavy reading. It's thick <laughs> and, you know, it's a big book. But, you know, explaining the history and the process and it was fascinating. But then I got to all these recipes. Mm. Can people really make this at home? Of course. Yeah. yeah. That's why the book's there. <laughs> so the whole... Uh, I would need special equipment though, right? To do this no, maceration. No. Right. And, no? Yeah. No. no, you would you would need a lot less than you would think to do it. You will not be able to reach the level that we reach here in a way because of the different type of filtering, different type of things that are used. But you can make a very, very decent. We made them for years just like yeah. this. So you just need some coffee filters. You need... Patience. Uh, you need Patience. some incense. You have to decide what you want to try to make. Some dark um, bottles. Well, even if you don't have a dark bottle, that's not the end of the you, world. You can reuse bottles. Yeah. No matter, you know. You need a hermetically sealed uh, glass jar uh, to start your maceration. And those are cheap. And you should hopefully live in a state where you can buy some neutral spirits. 95, 95, per, 95 uh, which is 190 proof, alcohol. is perfect. Because you want to start with something clean. And that's why we start with a, a very clean spirit, which is distilled wheat. And it has no taste. So that's the important thing. If you do something, say, in a white wine, you can actually make a white wine liqueur. That's how the Romans did. But you, you will add the taste of the wine. 
with the, with the neutral spirit, you won't have a beginning taste and you kind of know where you want to go with, with whatever it is you're going to put into it. But yeah, yeah, you can make them, sure. The better the distilled spirit you have, like the one that we have, ultra pure, it's distilled three times. Mm -hmm. And it's distilled three times in order to take away mm -hmm. any additional flavor that it could have mm -hmm. still remaining from the wheat base where it comes from. Mm -hmm. Because okay. if you were to just distill it once, especially uh, without a rectifier, with, uh, in a regular normal steel, you know, uh, you're going to have uh, a liquid of 70, 75%, 72% proof maximum, but it will still have the taste of the wheat. So yeah. if you want mm -hmm. to take it, uh, the wheat out, you have to distill it. Mm. Okay. So you two, as boomers, are at the age when many people are retiring. Mm. And well, you are building... <laughs> You're building a business. <laughs> so what keeps you motivated? Pleasure in doing it. Also giving other people pleasure and doing, doing something for me. Sometimes we'll go to New York with our distributor there. And we've had people come to our table with tears running down their face, telling us, thank you for making this the way you do. We really appreciate it. And I mean, that, that was just enough. I was like, okay, we go back and work now <laughs> wow. because it, it, yeah. To have somebody appreciate that in that way is just, it's really very rewarding and very, um, I guess it's sort of the applause at the end of the theatrical performance in a way, you know, yeah. you know actors work for an applause and that's our applause. <laughs> yeah. So, And you do, you put so much heart and passion into what you make. Yeah, we wouldn't do it well, any other way. Yeah, you have to. Otherwise, you don't do it. Yeah. That's just <laughs> us. <laughs> well, it, it is such a pleasure to have you close by. And if anybody that is on this call wants to uh, join me to go out there for a tasting, you can email me at wendy at heyboomer.biz, and we will set something up for sure. Sounds great. We'd and love I, to have you. Yes, I am sure that we will have a fabulous time. <laughs> I'll always be an expert now, right? Because I've Absolutely. been out here a couple of times. <laughs> uh, well, let me um, also share with people how they can find you and reach you. So they can go to the website. If, if you are not in the area and you plan to visit, you can go to salutellc.com slash visit, and you can actually um, reserve a visit online that way. So when you know you're coming through, um, that would be a great thing to do. And if you have particular questions or special events, or you know somebody in the restaurant business that absolutely needs some of these liqueurs, <laughs> you can call Jan at 864-420-0225. Yep, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, let me tell everybody about what's coming up before I let you go. So next week, as you all know, is Labor Day, and we won't have a show for Labor Day. But when we return on September 13th, I'm going to have Dr. Connie Zwieg as my guest. And Dr. Connie retired from her private psychotherapy practice after 22 years. She is the author of several books, and her latest book is called The Inner Work of Age, Shifting from Role, R-O-L-E, to Soul, S-O-U-L. And it's organized around the unconscious inner obstacles that block our capacity to fulfill the possibilities in our later life. So it should be a very interesting discussion. Um, her method is around shadow work and spiritual practices from many traditions. So that's on September 13th. Um, just a reminder to join the, um, Hey Boomer, Walked and Alzheimer's team. Like I said, we'll have 
Hey Boomer hats so we can be identified. Um, I think if you raise a hundred dollars, you get a Alzheimer's t-shirt. So it's a fun thing and it's a worthy cause. So please go to act.alz.org slash go to slash Hey Boomer. I'll put that in the comments so that you all can sign up or donate. All right. Thank you guys for being here today. This has been great fun. Yeah, it was. And thank all of you for tuning in today. I know it's a busy life we all lead. So thank you all for taking the time to join us on Hey Boomer. Um, let's meet at Vicario's and help me grow the audience, share this widely. And I always try to remind everybody of a saying from C.S. Lewis that you are never too old to set another goal or dream a new dream. Mm -hmm. True. Right? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so join me on the 13th. Have a great Labor Day and we will see you all soon. Thank you. All right. Bye. <laughs> bye. Are you at risk for stroke or cardiovascular disease? Get screened with Lifeline Screening for peace of mind or early detection. Screenings are painless, easy, and non-invasive. Over 700,000 people per year get screened at Lifeline Screening. Click in the show notes for a special offer for Hey Boomer listeners.